Good evening. This is our fifth lecture uh, in uh, literary texts, uh, Nusus Adabiyya uh, 313. Uh, we've read in the past two uh, uh, lectures, we've read together the story Evelyn by James Joyce, and we spoke about um, James Joyce and his writing. We also uh, made some comprehension questions on the story. Um, after reading the story for one or two times uh, in order to make sure that you understand it, uh, one has to start discussing it as a literary critic. And this is what we are going to do today. We are going to study what elements of fiction we can speak about in a short story. Reading a short story is different from the story told by a friend on what happened to her yesterday, although both have similarities. People generally stress the fact that a fictional story is not true. The characters and events are imagined. Yes, if I ask you what's the difference between the story that James Joyce has told us in uh, Evelyn and between a story that your friend uh, comes and tells you, uh, about uh, his life or uh, what happened with her husband this morning or what happened with his mother and so on, uh, you're going to tell me that the main difference is that me and my friends are real people who exist in real life while Evelyn is uh, somebody who is imaginary. This is an important difference but this is not the only difference and perhaps even not the most important difference. Uh, this is not the most important difference, and the most important difference is that a fictional story is constructed in such a way to produce a certain meaning, message, and emotional effect on the reader. When I tell a story to a friend, we would be both interested in what happened to me and to the people I'm talking about. But Joyce is not interested in the fate of Evelyn. Simply, simply because Evelyn does not exist. Joyce is interested in the message he is telling you, his reader, about life, about his country, Ireland, and about how he sees the world. Yes, we have to remember, actually, that Evelyn does not exist beyond the last sentence of the story. Once the story ends and we have a full stop, then there is no Evelyn. She does not exist. She only exists in, this, uh, in these sentences. And nothing will happen to her next. And uh, nothing has happened to her before the story opens. And the story is not told like a story that I tell you about my personal life uh, and that you can listen to the rest of it tomorrow or the day after tomorrow and see and go home and think what will she do in this problem and so on. Uh, a story, a short story is closed and um, the fate of its uh, characters does not go beyond the story. And the fate of its characters after the story is not really important. What is important is the message that the writer is trying to tell us by telling this story. Uh, he is using characters, he's using uh, uh, events, he's using everything in the story in order to tell us something. And this is what, as readers of fiction, we should be looking for. And it is this message that, as students of literature, we try to read and learn to analyze. We ask the question, what is the writer trying to say? Of course, once we start asking this question, we have definitely to avoid saying the writer is saying that we should do this or we should do that. That is looking for a moral or looking uh, for a lesson. This is definitely not what writers uh, of fiction are trying. They do have a message, but their message is not a moral lesson. And also, this does not mean that a writer sets out to give a lesson or make a statement. The whole point about what a writer says is that it cannot be said in a direct statement. 
or rather that if said in a direct statement, it will be different from the emotional and intellectual meaning we get from reading the work of fiction. Yes, if I tell you, for example, that Ireland is a suffocating place, this is very different from reading Evelyn and uh, feeling the details of her life and the conflict she is feeling because she has to um, decide whether to leave or not to leave. Um, perhaps the two have something in common, but they are basically different. And so to understand the message that is in a work of fiction or any work of literature, we need to ask another question. How does the writer say what he or she are saying? We thus have to know something about the structure, conventions, and traditions of a certain genre of literature. And this is what we will do today. What we will do today is to see how we can analyze uh, a genre of literature and we are going to apply the elements of, uh, of fiction on analyzing uh, um, a short story in particular. What I would like you to reach uh, in making the distinction uh, between um, telling friends stories and having um, a writer tell us a story is to um, understand that a writer is telling a story for uh, a certain meaning and not for uh, the sake of the story itself or the characters or the events. He, is, uh, he or she are trying to tell you, um, to give you a message as a reader, to, give you, to make you feel something, to have an effect, an emotional effect on you. Um, and we'll see how this uh, is done in Joyce's. What I said goes um, for all works of fiction and even theater, but uh, today we'll speak only about short stories. And uh, a short story as opposed to longer forms of fiction is special in its concentration. It depicts a moment in life, but a very revealing moment that seems to be capable of telling us a lot more than the story of the hours or days it, it is portraying. Uh, a short story writer usually chooses a very significant uh, moment in order to uh, tell us. He does not just tell any events. Um, he chooses a particular moment that has that is uh, very intense, that has, um, that has um, a problem that is almost exploding. And through that problem, through that moment, we can even, uh, we can learn the whole life, we can see the whole life of the character, or uh, we can see much more, in, uh, if it's a character or an event, we can see much more than the little event or the one character the writer is telling us about. Um, so we see this clearly in Evelyn, for example, where uh, you have only, you meet her for two or three hours, but when the story ends, you have actually known all of Evelyn's life and, um, and her deeper uh, thoughts and feelings and her existence. Let us see together how this is achieved in Evelyn and how we can talk about the structure and meaning of the short story through the elements that critics agree make up the job. So the first element that constitutes uh, um, the structure of a, a story is the element of plot. Um, and plot is usually discussed along with another element which is conflict. Plot is translated into Arabic as al-habka and conflict is a sara um, What do we mean by plot? We mean that it is how the writer uh, arranges the events of the of the story because the events are not 
uh, arranged in the same way that they happen, for example. Um, the, the, uh, even if uh, a writer is uh, writing about um, a, a real story, uh, the arrangement of the story and where to start and where to stop and what to uh, omit and what to put is um, what gives the story its meaning. And uh, this plot, the arrangement of the events, is always directed by a conflict. That is uh, the problem. What is, uh, what is warring against uh, what, or who is warring against who? Uh, le let's read the definition. Plot refers to the series of events that give a story its meaning and effect. In most stories, these events arise out of conflict experienced by the main character. The conflict may come from something external, like a dragon, or an overbearing mother, or it may stem from internal issue such as jealousy, loss of identity, or overconfidence. So uh, usually critics di differentiate between two kinds of uh, conflicts, either a conflict is a conflict between me and something external, another character, um, uh, the, m m another, um, another power, uh, whether natural or uh, social or something like this. Or a conflict can be something within me, an what we call an internal conflict. I could be split into two between uh, two desires or uh, two, um, two wishes, between uh, what I uh, want to do and what I have to do, etc. So um, conflicts are usually described as being either external or internal. And as the character uh, makes choices and tries to resolve the problem, the story's action is shaped and plot is generated. Yes, uh, the, the, the problem or the conflict is introduced at the beginning and then the events tell us how this conflict is played out. Uh, how I'm going to solve a problem if, for example, I, uh, uh, I am a character who um, is unable to make a decision between two, uh, uh, two men, two suitors, then I um, start... Uh, thinking about both of them and perhaps by the end of the novel or the story uh, I can make some sort of decision. If the uh, conflict is external, we speak about how, for example, a flood is uh, battling with a village and uh, what happens and how the people in the village try to survive, etc. And so the events are uh, always connected to that conflict. And usually a story, especially a short story, will not have more than one conflict. In some stories, the author structures the entire plot chronologically. Chronologically means uh, in, the, uh, in the arrangement, in the logical arrangement of time that it happened. What happened first comes first, and then next, and then next. With the first event followed by the second, third, and so on, like beads on a string. However, many other stories are told with flashback techniques in which plot events from earlier times interrupt the story's current events. If we think of uh, Evelyn as an example, then uh, definitely Evelyn does not, uh, the events of uh, Evelyn are not arranged chronologically. We don't see Evelyn as a young girl and then she grows up and then she uh, one time, and then her mother dies and then one time, uh, one day she meets Frank and she falls in love and then she thinks of leaving. We don't see it this way. We see Evelyn at uh, the age of 19, and then we start knowing things about her uh, childhood, things about her, uh, her mother, things about other members of family, 
and uh, then we know the story of Frank, etc. But all these are uh, arranged in a way, they're not just told as a biography, they're not told just to tell us uh, what Evelyn is uh, doing, but they are told in order to, uh, they are placed in the conflict, in the internal conflict of Evelyn as we are going to see. We only uh, know about the events that happen in her life as part of her um, internal dialogue and internal uh, conflict. Let's, before uh, seeing how the plot is structured in Evelyn, uh, see a graph of traditional plots generally. A traditional plot begins with rising action as the character experiences conflict through a series of plot complications. The conflict reaches a climax, after which the conflict is resolved and the falling action leads quickly to the story's end. Things have generally changed at the end of a story, either in the character or the situation. And this is called the resolution of the conflict. As you can see in this graph, uh, most stories, novels or short stories, or even dramas, usually have uh, this, uh, this shape for their plot. They start with an exposition, and an exposition means an introduction, if you like, where the characters are introduced, the situation is introduced, we know who we are going to be speaking about, and who is speaking to us. Is it um, a first-person narration, for example, like um, uh, somebody is telling us a story about herself, I am Fulan and... Uh, this is what happened to me, or is there a narrator, somebody who is telling us the story of somebody else, like in the case of Evelyn, um, she, Evelyn, sat beside the window. There is a voice who is telling us the story, a narrator, Rawi, uh, who is not telling us his own story, he's telling us the story of somebody else. Now, all this happens in the exposition or the introduction, if you like. And then uh, we have what we call rising action. Now, the rising action is all what happens in the story until uh, there comes a turning point. Um, and all what happens in the story, we call it either rising action or complications, meaning that there is a conflict, uh, and this conflict is uh, introduced, and this is the first complication. And then from that conflict, uh, from that uh, introduction or first complication, we start having more complications, more complications, and they are intensified in a way that finally reaches a point where a resolution or a solution has to be uh, made. And this is where the uh, story has a turning point and ends somewhere with a choice. If we are speaking about, uh, let me use the example, I used the flood and the village, uh, either the flood will have dest uh, destroyed the village or the villagers will have been able to stop the flood from destroying their place and their people. So. One, uh, just like any match or any conflict, one, um, one partner, one um, party will have uh, won by the end. Let's try to um, apply this graph to, um, to Evelyn. The story starts with these lines, uh, which we can call the exposition. She sat at the window watching the evening invade the avenue. Her head was leaned against the window curtains, and in her nostrils 
was the odor of dusty Cretan. She was tired. Now these lines tell us who the story is about and who is speaking to us. So we have a narrator speaking to us about a woman and placing her in, uh, in a home uh, quite, uh, uh, quite poor or at least not very rich and then he starts describing what's outside uh, the window. This is the exposition, that is, we know where we are, we know who we are speaking about, but we don't yet know what's the problem. In the next paragraph, uh, the problem is introduced for the first time when um, Evelyn is uh, thinking about all the changes that are happening in her neighborhood and at her home and uh, at, the, at the last line she says or the narrator tells us now she was going to go away like the others to leave her home and here the problem is introduced and we know that we have a conflict the conflict is inside Evelyn who is leaving her home and is apparently um, not very happy to say the least um, in fact the rest of the story is going to be actually a um, kind of balance or weighing between whether to leave her home or not what is good about staying at home and what is good about leaving why does she not want to stay at home and why does she not want to, uh, to leave? Uh, we have all sorts of reasons and uh, of feelings from uh, past and present. Uh, they are all mixed up. She uh, keeps remembering things, uh, things from her past and things from her present uh, in this uh, weighing of whether to go or not to go. And uh, with each uh, with each uh, piece of event, if you like, or with each um, with each complication, with each bead in this uh, string, you have the uh, conflict intensified. You have uh, Evelyn feeling um, more pressured uh, into taking a decision, which she does at what we call the climax. Let's see how um, these events or these complications uh, take place. First, we have the fact that the place is changing and therefore this, is, this goes into the balance of uh, Evelyn also changing her life. Now she was going away like the others to leave her home. But then, the next paragraph immediately tells us that this is not so easy because home is something uh, that she cherishes and that she um, considers as very important, as something that she cannot leave all that easily. Home, she looked round the room, reviewing all its familiar objects which she had dusted once a week for so many years, wondering where on earth all the dust came from. Perhaps she would never see again those familiar objects from which she had never dreamed of being divided. Here we have uh, um, a detail that tells us that it's not easy for Evelyn to, uh, to leave, that even dusting the home is going to be something to be missed. So um, here we have something that we would put on the, um, on the other uh, uh, balance, if you like, uh, saying that she needs to stay home and not to leave. And um, the story keeps giving us 
reasons for leaving and reasons for staying. And each one of these, we call them, uh, in the structure of the story, we call them complications. We next have um, another complication, which is where she's leaving. She's leaving um, with somebody that she believes uh, they are in love. She had consented to go away to leave her home. Was that wise? She tried to weigh each side of the question. Um, we clearly know that uh, she is not determined yet and she is not, um, not sure what to do although she had consented to go away. And in a, in a couple of paragraphs after that, we will know that she is about to leave in that moment. And yet she is still thinking um, backward and forward whether this is the right step to take or not. And so complications arise as we learn more about Evelyn's life. She does not tell us the story of her life chronologically. That is ordered in the sequence events take place. But we get to know her life through her, her conflict, to leave or, not, or to stay home. Each detail about her past life, her present life, her relation with members of her family, her dreams of the future is understood as part of the conflict, to leave or to stay home. When she tells us what she is doing in her home, uh, what responsibilities she has, she tells us this in the context of this conflict of her. And this is what we mean by uh, the arrangement of the plot. Every detail has meaning in the context of, of the conflict that is uh, related. Uh, we don't have details that cannot be fit somewhere into this conflict. And, um, and so we learn about the responsibilities of um, Evelyn in the house, the fact that she is the one who has to clean the house, she's the one who cooks, she's the one who takes care of the little children, and all these details are not there for themselves. They are there to take part in the conflict, uh, whether to leave or not to leave. Um, and again, the, the good things about leaving uh, are not uh, there for themselves. The love story between her and Frank is not uh, there to tell us a love story that we can follow. Uh, she, she is telling us this love story in the context of this conflict inside her heart about leaving or not. Now, you can see this clearly if you try to tell the story of Evelyn chronologically. That is in the sequence of um, how it happened. You can start telling the story, writing the story of Evelyn as a young child Evelyn was a young child in Dublin. She used to, uh, to play in the street with other children. Uh, her father was, not, uh, was quite harsh and he would not want them to play in the street. Um, as they grew up, the city started to change and new buildings, richer buildings, have taken the place of the fields. And now they are like on the outskirts of this city. She apparently has not been well educated. She only works as, um, uh, as a, um, an employee at a, um, a shop. And uh, she is a shop girl and nothing more. And um, her mother has died. And she fell in love with a boy. This is how I would uh, 
tell the story chronologically, but this is not how Joyce is telling us the story. Joyce is telling us the story in a way where all these events um, can help in intensifying the conflict. And he says the least, um, the least important um, aspects that would intensify the conflict at the beginning, and then they start being more important. We as readers live the conflict with her. We are not sure what to choose. What is better? Is Frank true in his promises? Will she regret leaving her father and the little brothers and sisters? The story is not an essay weighing the pros and cons of leaving home but an emotional struggle of the character that we as readers share with her. This is important because um, I can write, again, I can, uh, just as, as I can uh, relate the story chronologically, and it would be very different from what Joyce has written, because Joyce wants to uh, tell us the conflict of this girl. This is the important thing, and so he arranges the plot in a way that uh, reveals, that shows us the uh, conflict of the, uh, of the character, Evelyn. Uh, also, he is not trying to tell us whether it's good or bad to live in Dublin. This could be the subject of an essay where you can write the pros and cons of staying in Dublin or staying in Egypt or whatever. But he is trying to... Um, impart the, uh, the, the, the emotional struggle of uh, this girl. And through living in this emotional struggle of the girl, we can understand something that is uh, different, as I told you at the beginning, that is different from uh, a direct message about whether it is good to stay in Dublin or to leave Dublin. The complications rise in their intensity and power. If the decision is to leave the neighborhood, which has now changed anyway, then perhaps the decision is easy. Yes, the, this, um, this is the first thing that Evelyn uh, gives us. She is watching from, the, uh, from her window uh, the, the neighborhood, and the neighborhood has changed, and she is leaving. This sounds quite logical and easy. But later, we have more difficult points put into the balance. For example, the promise to the dying mother to keep the home together and take care of the young children. Now, she gives us the, mo the most difficult uh, decisions at the end rather than at the beginning. Uh, so when we think that uh, perhaps the conflict is not so difficult, the conflict starts intensifying and uh, revealing all the difficult parts about it. So difficult that it cannot be sustained anymore and a decision has to be made. You can see here, her time was running out, but she continued to sit by the window, leaning her head against the window curtain inhaling the odor of dusty Creton. Down, far in the avenue, she could hear a street organ player. She knew the air. Strange that it should come that very night to remind her of the promise to her mother, her promise to keep the home together as long as she could. Now, here at the time when she has... Uh, told us as readers, she has told us all the reasons why to stay and why not to stay, and we are uh, about to think that uh, leaving is a better option for uh, Evelyn, and leaving is the option that she will choose. We find uh, this promise to the mother, and it sounds like something very difficult to break. Uh, she listens to the, the song, she knew the air, and she is reminded 
of the same song that was played when her mother died and she at that uh, point promised her mother to keep the home and to take care of the children. Um, so we feel that this, is, this makes the decision much more difficult and this is what we mean by complications. We have um, a conflict that sounds easy at the beginning to leave the neighborhood in which she grew or not and then we have something extremely difficult to break a promise to the mother to a dead mother or not but then this um, this promise to the mother this mother has another face as well or the relation to the mother has another face as she mused the pitiful vision of her mother's life laid its spell on the very quick of her being that life of commonplace sacrifices closing in final craziness so remembering the mother uh, makes her remember the promise but it also makes her remember the fact that the mother lived a very miserable life that ended up in um, death and in craziness and she does not want to have the same fate as her mother and therefore the decision is to escape she stood up in a sudden impulse of terror escape she must escape Frank could save her uh, this is what we call the climax the girl has had uh, this conflict of to leave or not to leave putting the different reasons why to leave and why not to leave and uh, putting all the reasons for uh, why she loves her home and needs to stay and needs to keep the promise to her mother and then also the fact that this is a um, suffocating place that she is working hard and nobody's appreciating her nobody's respecting her nobody's giving her um, any comfort or uh, any love and um, she does not want to live the life of her mother so uh, she escapes this last uh, thing is what makes her decide that escaping is the solution the moment she decides this we are speaking about a climax what we mean by a climax is uh, the highest point of the complications where uh, something is going to change now what is going to change we have had Evelyn thinking whether to go or not to go when she reaches this point she reaches a point where she is not going to have any conflict anymore she's going to decide to leave and this is what we call the climax it's the highest point of the rising action and after uh, this point the events of the story change the promise to the mother and the situation of the mother are the two points that finally make make her make her decision or take her decision she weighs both and decides that escaping the fate of the mother is more important than keeping the promise to her. Of course, except that the story does not end there. And most uh, short stories have this false ending, if you like. Uh, they seem to end the, um, the conflict, but then we are... Um, we find that this is not exactly the ending and here I would like to remind you of the images that we did in poetry yes remember the uh, images the metaphors the personifications the similes and all sorts of images uh, the story actually ends in two very powerful images which we have spoken about last time but uh, perhaps we can 
remember them now because they um, take the place of events. If uh, throughout the story Joyce has told us uh, whether Evelyn is going to leave or not to leave through uh, words and events, he tells us why she does not leave only through images. And it is for us, the readers, to decide what these images mean. The ending of the story can only be understood if we understand the two images that end the story. We're going to read them together and uh, see how we can analyze them and how we can place them as um, a resolution to the conflict of Evelyn and as part of the structure of that story. She stood among the swaying crowd in the station at the north wall. He held her hand and she knew that he was speaking to her, saying something about the passage over and over again. The station was full of soldiers with brown baggages. Through the wide doors of the sheds, she caught a glimpse of the black mass of the boat lying in beside the quay wall with illuminated portholes. She answered nothing. She felt her cheek pale and cold, and out of a maze of distress, she prayed to God to direct her, to show her what was her duty. The boat blew a long mournful whistle into the mist. If she went, tomorrow she would be on the sea with Frank, steaming towards Buenos Aires. Their passage had been booked. Could she still draw back after all he had done for her? Her distress awoke a nausea in her body, and she kept moving her lips in silent, fervent prayer. So, this in this scene, uh, we have Evelyn standing at the quay. Rasif al-Mina. And there we seem to have to see uh, Frank, but uh, almost uh, very shadowy. He is there trying to tell her to come, but uh, say, saying something about the passage over and over again. But of course, uh, she is almost deaf to what he says. Uh, she says he held her hand and she knew that he was speaking to her. Uh, she knew he was speaking to her but apparently did not even answer. And he started telling her that they have to go and cross the quay in order to uh, get on the boat. And she stood there, answered nothing. Um, one of the images that I would like you to um, to think of is the visual image of the ship, how the ship is portrayed. Through the wide doors of the sheds, she caught a glimpse of the black mass of the boat lying in beside the quay wall with illuminated portholes. Try to imagine this visual image. She, ha she sees the boat as a total blackness, and blackness is usually associated with evil, unknown, all what you uh, can think of, with only portholes, the uh, round, small um, windows of a ship. So uh, it's a total black mass, unknown to her, and only the portholes are lighted. It's as if it is... Uh, a world that uh, she does not know and uh, is totally dark to her. Okay, and uh, then this boat blew a long mournful whistle. Uh, the whistle, the Serena, the Markip, is described here as mournful. Ganaizeya or Hazina. So um, she, of course, listens to it in that way because she feels that something is going to die. Perhaps her existence in this uh, city, her, her um, relationship to her family, the ties that 
uh, draw her to the place and the people uh, in Dublin. All this uh, is going to die somehow, uh, and the boat is the one that is blowing this mournful whistle um, for it. If she went tomorrow, she would be on the sea with Frank steaming towards Buenos Aires. Their passage had been booked. Could she still draw back after all he had done for her? And here we realize that uh, what we thought of as a resolution is only false. She is still thinking to go or not to go, to leave or not to leave. Her distress awoke a nausea in her body and she kept moving her lips in silent, fervent prayer. So she was still asking God to tell her what to do. She was not sure what she is supposed to do. A bell clanged upon her heart. She felt him seize her hand. Come. All the seas of the world tumbled about her heart. He was drawing her into them. He would drown her. She gripped with both hands at the iron railing. Come. Again, here, uh, Joyce is not giving us ideas what she thought or what she felt. He is only giving us images. And uh, it is through analyzing these images that we can guess or try to understand what uh, Evelyn uh, really felt or um, decided at the end. A bell clanged upon her heart means um, that she felt the beating of her heart. There is this you can speak about um, the heart being compared to a metaphor, a metaphor uh, where the heart is being compared to uh, a bell um, and sounding very, very powerfully. So um, her heart was uh, beating very strongly. Uh, one's heart beats strongly when you're afraid, when you're deeply in love, when you're extremely happy. But we are left to uh, decide why is uh, Evelyn feeling her heart beating so much. All the seas of the world tumbled about her heart. He was drawing her into them. He would drown her. This is another image. She does not just feel that her heart is banging like uh, a bell, but she feels that her heart is um, being invaded or being drowned by all the seas in the world. So she feels the, the, her heart is like perhaps a ship or a person who is drowning. And he, Frank, was drawing her into them, that is the seas, and he would drown her. So she is actually afraid of Frank. Now she feels that Frank is going to endanger her life. And so uh, here, when we have to analyze this uh, image, we have to think, what, what is drowning uh, to Evelyn? What is going to drown her? Is being away from Dublin drowning? Is all uh, the respect and the good life drowning? Uh, we have to ask these questions. But apparently, to her, going out of, uh, of Dublin would be actually like drowning, perhaps like a fish going out of water. She gripped with both hands at the iron railing. All she could do was to hold fast to the, uh, iron, of the, uh, the iron railing of the K, Sur al Rasif al Mina, and to stop uh, listening to whatever he is telling her. No, 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 it was impossible. Her hands clutched the iron in frenzy. Amid the seas, she sent a cry of anguish. He calls her, but 
she does not listen. He rushed beyond the barrier and called to her to follow. He was shouted at to go on, but he still called to her. She set her white face to him, passive like a helpless animal. Her eyes gave him no sign of love or farewell or recognition. The image of Evelyn at the end is a helpless animal, as if she does not choose uh, the decision that she has made. We have seen her before choose the decision, the logical decision, which is to leave. Once she was going to leave, she becomes that helpless animal who feels that uh, this decision is going to drown her and she feels she can only um, she can only stay here and she her eyes give no sign of love or farewell or recognition as if she stops being logical or being a human being at all and it's only instincts instincts of an animal that are driving her and uh, this gives us the ending of uh, the story and the ending of the plot, the resolution of the plot, which was um, quite different from the climax as we expected it. Uh, next time we will do more elements uh, of, of the story in order to see how we can analyze it. Thank you.